On Tuesday and Wednesday, hearings took place at the High Court of Justice in the United Kingdom to determine the fate of Julian Assange's appeal permission. This is perhaps the last legal process standing between him and extradition to the United States where he will face charges on 18 counts, 17 of them under the infamous Espionage Act. Assange has been in jail for years without charge or trial pending a decision on this appeal process. Throughout these years, US government lawyers have sought to deny the fact that he is a journalist and have tried to dub him a spy. At the same time, across the world, a powerful movement has arisen, demanding his freedom, stressing on his work as a journalist and publisher and highlighting the political nature of the case against Assange. Let's go to Anish to find out what happened during these two days. Anish, thanks for joining us. We saw another crucial chapter in the Julian Assange uh, saga unfolding over the past few, uh, past couple of days, uh, last-ditch attempt to prevent his extradition to the United States. Uh, of course, this uh, has been going on for a long time now, so for the benefit of our viewers, could you maybe tell us what really was happening over the past few, two days, what, when, what was this stage of the process, and then we'll go into what some of the arguments. Uh, let's begin with uh, the fact that this is possibly and potentially, as you pointed out, the final uh, you know court hearing that Assange would have in the United Kingdom if it doesn't get through. Especially uh, if it does get through, then he has a chance to appeal uh, the extradition ruling. Now, this is this is an appeal permission ruling, and so it has a different, a slightly different set of, uh, you know, the manner in which uh, the proceedings are going to happen. Uh, obviously, it's a two-judge two bench, but uh, it definitely has a different tone and tenor in which uh, like compared to past rulings uh, it is not as it is not going to be as detailed we only had like two days of hearings and the amount of evidence uh, submitted uh, are not uh, that heavy if it is, or substantial and that is going to and it's not needed especially but it is definitely going to uh, mark a significant uh, whatever decision comes out of it is going to have a significant and profound impact on not just the Assange case in general. Uh, it is uh, also going to have an impact on, you know, free speech or press freedoms pretty much for everyone. And that is something that pretty much looms large uh, throughout the case. And that is primarily what we see uh, the focus of the defense's arguments are about because it is not, uh, the focus has all uh, right now centered around the fact that Assange is a journalist and he is being prosecuted for a political crime. So it is uh, it is best for the UK and for pretty much everybody else to not allow for an extradition like this. Right. So Anish, then going into that point, what are some of the arguments you mentioned? Could you elaborate a bit more on the defence arguments and then we'll come to what uh, the US government was arguing? Well, one of the uh, the uh, the first argument that the defense presented was uh, that uh, the entire case itself is a political case. This was not a new one. It uh, it was done uh, in the previous set of hearings as well. Since the beginning, since 2020, when the first uh, trial ha actually happened at the magistrate's court uh, before Vanessa Beretsa, the judge, district judge Vanessa Beretsa, and uh, it pretty much uh, it has two aspects. One is the fact that the entire uh, the intention behind is it is political. The fact that the Trump administration went out on a political vendetta against uh, Assange, and it is uh, you know steered by political appointees, and clearly uh, showing that the entire intentionality and the process that went behind it uh, was definitely quite a political one, and that is something that is uh, that is not allowed or uh, that will not stand as grounds for extradition as per the US-UK extradition treaty. Uh, on the other hand, it uh, defense lawyers also pointed out the fact that the case against him is that of espionage. And espionage primarily, uh, since it's, uh, it's an offense against the state, it is going to be uh, a political one. And that definitely, uh, you know, that will mark the manner in which he will be prosecuted back in the United States as well because the state then obviously becomes the one who is prosecuting, the ones who is accusing becomes untouchable in that sense. And that is definitely what the prosecution has concentrated on a large part. The fact that this entire thing is political, that there is a significant uh, you know, conflict of interest considering the fact that the state is both the accuser and the prosecutor 
and also the judge in this case and and especially so because there are already allegations of the fact that uh, assange uh, there were attempts to uh, shut down wikileaks there were attempts to kidnap or assassinate assange by the state itself or arms of the state including the intelligence community so this uh, these factors should be taken into account which was not done by previous uh, judges, including uh, the uh, including Vanessa Beretzer, who actually uh, you know rejected the extradition uh, plea based on men, uh, health issues, or uh, the fact that he's uh, su a suicide risk, and you know the fact that the possibility of death is something that can actually kill an extradition plea. So that is that was the only ground she did not consider the political aspect of the crime. Uh, or uh, the offense uh, in in question, or for that matter, the the entire manner in which there is a significant conflict of interest uh, behind this entire prosecution in itself. Um, then, obviously, they uh, brought out you know the significant human rights uh, issues that uh, uh, you know that can actually uh, arise once he is extradited. Uh, this includes the fact that uh, Assange, being a foreign citizen, he's not he's not a U.S. citizen and also is somebody who is based out of the United States, he will not be entitled to the First Amendment rights, which includes, uh, you know, press freedom. So he cannot ap appeal against the prosecution uh, under the First Amendment right uh, as a journalist or as a publisher. He is also not entitled to a fair trial in many ways because a large part of his rights can be uh, set aside, especially when it comes to espionage. Uh, the Espionage Act in itself is a very restrictive uh, piece of legislation. It is already quite controversial among civil liberty circles in the United States and has been criticized for how it pretty much infringes on human rights and a person's right to a fair trial. And that is already there in the United States. There's an ongoing debate and you know controversy around it. And that is not being considered as well by the courts. And obviously, there is the fact that the United States has not given any assurance that there will not be new charges coming up. And this includes the fact that uh, the Vault 7 uh, uh, disclosures, the publication of Vault 7 uh, documents, which was pretty much the trigger for this prosecution, uh, it has not been uh, taken into account by federal prosecutors in the United States. So additional charges can happen and that also means that he can be uh, charged with, uh, you know, crimes, including, uh, you know, uh, war against the state or sedition, or seditious like uh, legal uh, provisions that carry death penalty, which is, again, something that the U.S. has not assured. Uh, they have only assured that uh, there is some there will be a framework for a fair trial and that he will be kept under uh, you know, human conditions or basic human conditions in the prisons and nothing else. There was nothing, no other assurances given by the United States and the prosecutor, uh, sorry, uh, the prosecutors were not able to, and in fact denied that there will be any kind of assurances coming on these matters. And these factors were, uh, there were other factors that were obviously taken up, but these are some of the most crucial uh, aspects of the defense's argument. Anish, and finally, what next, as in what are the next stages in the process? When do we get to know what happens? We're not sure because the judges have reserved the judgment. So that means that until and unless they give a date on uh, for a decision, uh, we are not sure when it is going to happen. It can take uh, a, a couple of weeks or maybe even months for the decision to come. Uh, in the meanwhile, Assange continues to be uh, in prison, in high security prison virtually in isolation from the rest of the world uh, in Belmarsh. And it is going to near uh, complete about five years in that prison cell uh, uh, without any charge, uh, virtually speaking. He is under judicial remand and he's already serving a prison sentence by going through this entire process, the delays in this process as well. So this is uh, pretty much the situation that we are in. Uh, we are pretty much hinging at a very last resort uh, judicial process within the UK. Obviously, the defense team is talking about approaching the European Court because at the time when Assange was being prosecuted, uh, he was essentially also, uh, UK was essentially also part of the European Union and was is still party to the ECHR, which means that it can be taken up in the European Court. But we are not sure if that means that there will be a stay 
or a hold on the extradition. So this this legal uh, this appeal permission appeal is going to be the final uh, say in many ways. If the courts for some reason uh, allows for this appeal to go through and permits it, then the, we will have some further uh, legal procedures. But that is something that is that is only if there is a positive outcome for this decision. Decision. Nish, thank you so much for that update. After an extremely controversial election, Pakistan is said to have a new government. The establishment parties, that is the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz or the PMLN of former Prime Ministers Nawaz Sharif and Shahbaz Sharif and the Pakistan's People's Party have come together to form a coalition. Shahbaz Sharif will return as the Prime Minister and PPP leader Asif Ali Sardari is set to become the next president. Now these parties were in power before the elections too, having come together after the overthrow of then Prime Minister Imran Khan in 2022. Khan's party was not allowed to officially contest in the elections, but independents backed by it emerged as the single largest force. The PTI has alleged large-scale rigging of results and claimed that the victory was stolen from it. It is clear that Pakistan is set for more turmoil even as the economic situation remains grim. We go to Abdul for more details on what happened. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. So it does look like there's some kind of a political arrangement that is concretizing in Pakistan. Of course, the controversies have not ended. A lot of contentious issues remaining around the election. We'll come to that. But first of all, uh, what is the new arrangement that is a new dispensation that is likely to take power? And, you know, what is the electoral strength or strength in the legislature? Rather? Well, uh, as per the latest reports which are coming from Pakistan, uh, the P uh, Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz, basically the party of the former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, which basically emerged as the first, a single largest party, if we uh, minus PTI's independence because of the circumstances in which they were forced to contest as independent, uh, has kind of agreed to uh, form an alliance with Pakistan People's Party, PPP, again uh, the party of the former Prime Minister, now deceased uh, Benazir Bhutto. Um, and uh, they have kind of agreed to also bring in smaller parties like uh, Mutahida Qomi Movement, uh, which has some 18 seats uh, from Balu uh, from Sin, sorry. And apart from that, uh, these uh, major parties, uh, there are also smaller parties which are going to be the part of that alliance. And they will together form a government both in the National Assembly uh, and they have agreed to kind of try their luck in Baluchistan and in uh, Punjab province as well. In Sindh, of course, PPP has single majority, so it does not need an alliance as much. Uh, but uh, apart from the fact that uh, in the alliance, Shahbaz Sharif, a uh, former prime minister who was who is also a brother of Nawaz Sharif, will be uh, the prime minister. And the uh, speaker of the uh, National Assembly will also be from the same uh, Nawaz Sharif's party. Uh, rest of the posts and the posts of governors in different other states like say uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Punjab will go to PPP but PPP had decided not to be a part of a future government uh, formally. They will support them in the assembly but they will not be uh, formally part of it but other smaller parties may become part of the government. So in a way it is a repeat of the uh, uh, PDM which was there in power before the caretaker government took over seven months before and Shabash Shari, under Shabash Sharif's prime ministership. So uh, that is the larger uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, as I said before, they are uh, also going to have uh, try at least. Whether, we are not sure whether they will be successful or not to form governments in Baluchistan uh, and in Punjab in coalition. So that is the latest arrangement which has been made. Uh, this was decided, of course, this was this proposal was there on the table for a, uh, for ever since the uh, official results were by and large declared uh, by the ECP. Uh, 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 but uh, there were some problems in between. But suddenly there was an overnight development on uh, uh, Wednesday and this uh, 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 final agreement was reached. I believe uh, Asif Ali Sardari, the husband of Benazir Bhutto, and the father of the current party leader will also be the president of the country as well. Exactly. That is the part of the arrangement, yeah. Right. Abdul, so uh, now this, uh, the next question naturally is what does this mean for the country? We know that the mandate was, of course, uh, in some senses, 
the Pakistan Tehreek Insaf Party of former Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, did morally at least emerge as the single largest force. But like you said, it was not allowed to contest for the elections. So you have a kind of a government where the single largest party uh, is probably uh, excluded from power. And uh, that does look like the mandate has kind of been twisted by this arrangement as well. Well, uh, uh, PTI, in fact, has decided, uh, as per the latest news, to go to the Supreme Court and appeal against the results. Uh, and it insists, it insists that uh, the mandate was stolen from it. And uh, uh, around 50 or even more of the seats which PTI claims to have won were not basically given to some other parties. That's the claim they are making. Uh, meanwhile, they have also joined uh, a smaller party, which is, of course, not represented in the National Assembly, uh, in order to claim uh, the, the reserve seats. We should remember that there are around uh, six, 70 reserve seats which will be distributed to the parties in the National Assembly. Uh, so the as far as the, uh, uh, the uh, kind of trajectory of the Pakistan politics is concerned uh, after the formation of this government, if at all it happens, it will be decided, of course, before 29th of February. Uh, but there are there will be issues which we, uh, which every Pakistani will be very keen, uh, keenly watching. Of course, one is what will be the fate of the PTI, uh, uh, whether it will have uh, its claims verified by the courts or the uh, that will lead to another confrontation between PTI and uh, the uh, government and the larger establishment which Pakistan is always credited to, credited to have, like the armies and so on and so forth. That is one, of course. Uh, that will decide the political stability in the future of Pakistan's uh, politics. Apart from that, the new government, uh, whenever it is uh, formed, will have a massive challenge to deal with the economic situation which Pakistan is facing at the time. Much of this, of course, is a, a problem which is created during uh, Shabazz Sarif's previous uh, uh, term in power. And uh, it seems now he's coming back to power and how he will deal with it, uh, given the fact that Shabazz Sarif is not she seen so far as a as a person who has an economic vision for uh, for the country. Nevertheless, since he is going to be the prime minister and there will be a massive uh, uh, set of people who, who will be kind of looking forward towards this uh, uh, government, it will there will be a challenge to deliver on that front, particularly immediately the front which is related to the price rise of the essential commodities. In fact, there are already news coming uh, that the uh, prices of electricity is going to be further up uh, in the coming days, uh, which was already very high uh, much before uh, the formation of the current government. So the economic issues will be uh, the dominating factor, but the political stability which PTI and the uh, allegedly stolen elections has created will be uh, something which uh, everyone needs to watch carefully uh, to see what where Pakistan is going uh, from now on. Thank you so much for that update. And that's all we have time for in Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.